What is the importance of having a guru or a spiritual master when one is aware of having divine grace? They're, they're really one in the same. It's not either or. The distinction that I've experienced on a personal level is when the ego kicks in, when illusion kicks in, when ignorance kicks in, when all of that that makes us all so human kicks in, divine grace doesn't reach down and slap you silly. Divine grace is sort of content to just be there, shine upon you, flow upon you, bestow itself upon you. And when you come back to it, when you work your way out of your ego, when you work your way out of the illusion, you see grace. It's like the sun doesn't chase you into your dark room. The sun is there, it's shining. If you want to keep your curtains closed all day or keep your window really dirty, the sun's not going to bang on your window and say, come on, come on, come on. The guru, for me, has always been much more of one who isn't prepared to put up with my stuff quite as much as divine grace that's amorphous and just there is. The guru's the one who's going to say in whatever language or whatever way, depending on the guru, but some variation of, oh, really? Really, that's how you think? It all is. Oh, really, that's how, who you think you are. The number of times in my, in my life that Pooja Swamiji, and he's, as far as gurus go, he's incredibly gentle. He's on the just as the sun is content to shine when you want to open your windows, it's there. He's definitely on that end of the spectrum. He's not the type who's going to constantly be saying to you, you should be this, be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be thinking this. He's really very deeply entrenched in his own faith in God and in the universe and in knowing that when the time is right, you'll wake up and you'll go and he'll be there. But nonetheless, he's very, very present. Very present. Even if he's not actually saying, do this, think like that, be like this, he's right there. And the vast majority of the teachings that he's given me over the years have actually been in the form of questions. I'll go to him with, oh my God, this. And he'll just sort of very gently, very matter-of-factly turn it around. One example is the day I had been here, a year, a year and a half or so, and he had taken me to see a group of 10 or 11 schools in a slum area outside of Delhi that had wanted him and his foundation to adopt them. They were very, very poor, being managed by a small trust that no longer had the financial ability to keep managing them. But children every day were showing up, and they had come to him and said, can you, can you take over these schools? So he took me to see them, and I, I held it together during the day. But as we were in the car on the way back, the tears started, and I just cried, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. The situation was so dire. 
and and my whole life, all what I had wanted to do was help children. I mean, that was why I had gotten into child psychology. It was what touched me so deeply. Being here about the work was the children. And to spend your day seeing kids who not only were poor, not only were disadvantaged, but what what pulled the tears for me so deeply was their their gratitude, their joy. The world that I grew up in was people who were bitter for what they didn't have, people who were angry about what they didn't have, people who were all too aware of what they didn't have in comparison to others. And, well, they damn well better get it because if not, the system was unfair or you were at fault or, you know, there was an anger and a bitterness which, of course, is very, very understandable. But here we had these children who were far worse off than anyone I had ever met. But there wasn't a trace of bitterness. You'd, you'd hand out, we brought you know, cookies and biscuits and fruit and whatnot and things to distribute to the kids. And you'd hand out biscuits. And the older ones would grab them first, of course. But then instead of hiding it behind their back to grab another with the other hand and pulling them out of the hands of others, without realizing that we actually had enough for everyone, they would take them and start to break them into little pieces to share. And it wasn't until we convinced them that really we had enough for everyone would the older kids even begin to eat. And so it was just a day that had pulled my heart right out. And I'm crying and I'm crying and we get back to our ashram in Delhi and it's dinner time and they serve dinner and I'm crying and I'm crying and I can't eat and oh my God, these kids and they have no food. And Pudra Swamiji looks at me and he says, are your tears helping them? Question. Are your tears helping them? And I kept crying. I'm like, no, no, of course not. But oh my God, those kids. And again, he looks at me. Are your tears helping those children? Well, no, of course, I had to admit they were not. And he then turned to me with, there was no criticism, there was no judgment, it was simply a stating of the obvious. And he said, your tears are only helping your own ego. He said, you feel like a very compassionate person. You feel like, look, I'm crying about these children. That makes you feel very compassionate. He said, but actually, it's not helping the children at all. If you really want to help the children, eat your dinner, go to sleep, and get up tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock and start figuring out how we are going to raise the money to adopt these 10 schools. And so that's what I did. But I, I share this particular story, there are dozens like it, because the teaching begins with just a question. It's a question, but now it's a question that never would have occurred to me had the guru not been there. In fact, my relationship with divine grace would have looked something like, depending on the mood I was in, either, oh God, do something for those children, please. And I would have cried myself to sleep with hands in prayer. Oh God, do something. And when I woke up in the morning and realized that nothing had yet been done, I would have still cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and prayed. But the idea of getting off my behind and actually like wiping my tears and starting to figure it out would have taken me a while. Or my relationship with divine grace would have been, how can you exist? How can you exist in a world where this is happening? 
if there is divine grace, he, how is there this misery and this poverty? And so I share that because simply being aware of divine grace for me would not have been enough to pull me out of my ego. It needed the touch of a very real, very present, very able to understand me and reflect that back on me, being of the Guru. And so I would say that in my experience, in the experience of many, many people I know, the Guru is really important. If you are someone who doesn't have much of an ego, if you are someone whose family of origin, your parents, your family, the culture that you grew up in, was one that really, really just supported the divinity and the fullness of who you are, and if no matter what you did, no matter what grades you got in school, no matter how you perform, just continue to support and encourage and love and praise the fullness and divinity of who you are. Then you might, you might be able to get by without a guru. You might be able to simply connect to grace and live in that. But for those of us who grew up in families and cultures, very well-meaning, very well-intentioned, beautiful hearts, but who didn't, for example, always simply support and love and praise us regardless of what grades we got in school, regardless of how we played on the playground, regardless of whether our room was clean or dirty. Those of us who grew up in a world in which who we are and how worthy we felt was contingent in any way upon what we did, how we performed, how we looked. Anybody whose parents ever said things like, why can't you be like so-and-so? Again, well-meaning. They're all doing the very best we can, they can. But what that does to our psyche is it creates a sense of, I am how I perform. I am my grades. I am my results. I am all of these things. And this is how the ego develops. And then the ego spends the rest of your life playing games playing games to make itself feel okay. And they may be games of the mind, they may be games of the heart, so the relationships that it gets you in. The ego plays all kinds of games. The situations it puts us in, the people it makes us fall in love with, the people it makes us fight with, these are, all, these are all games of, of the ego to work out the stuff that we're trying to work our way through. And for that, if you don't have a guru, it's very, very, very difficult because the ego is so good. It's so good at convincing you of whatever it wants to convince you. And what guru means, literally, is simply the one who removes the darkness and brings the light. That's what a guru is. It's gotten slightly a negative connotation in the West, where we worship freedom and independence and autonomy and sovereignty, you know. And the idea of having a guru somehow makes us feel like it's infringing in some way on my autonomy, on my sovereignty, on my freedom, you know. Now there's going to be this person who's going to tell me what to do. But the truth is, if you're really honest, 
most of us aren't free anyway. Whether it's our fears, whether it's our desires, whether it's our identities, whether it's our conditioning, whatever it may be, we're, we're living as slaves to that. Addictions, whatever, whatever we may be struggling with, we're already not free. We're just living in service of patterns of thought, habits of living, expectations, attachments, desires. We're already following someone else's agenda, the ego's agenda. And so having a guru simply means I'm going to make a conscious decision to follow the teachings of the light, to follow the teachings of that which has my highest growth, my highest evolvement as its only goal. My ego's got so many goals. Not, sadly, my highest evolvement or my enlightenment. The ego, in fact, needs me to stay small and stuck because that's the only way it lives. Its entire reign is dependent upon keeping me in fear of it. So the ego needs to keep you stuck. The guru is trying to set you free, to show you the light. So... I would, I would strongly suggest it. It's not absolutely essential. There are examples in our spiritual history of people, people who attained enlightenment without the presence of a guru, but it's very rare. And what there's a lot more of is people who ended up not, not living the lives that they could have lived, not living in the peace, in the joy, in the light that they could have lived in if they hadn't been such a slave to their ego or such a slave to their history, such a slave to their identity or their desires or their programming. That's much, much more frequent than people automatically attaining enlightenment. And so if you simply wanted to look at, you know, probabilities, probably you're going to be much better off with a guru. 